what what we actually see is a system which you know, it, it is clearly able to control at the moment the shall we say day-to-day -day problems which may arise it's very strong but what i would suggest is that it's increasingly brittle its capacity to respond to systemic shocks is constantly declining and with each new crisis it declines a little bit more this is a conversation with mark galeotti Mark is the director of the consulting company Mayak Intelligence, an honorary professor at UCL, a former advisor to the British Foreign Office, and one of the most widely recognized experts on Russia and its foreign and security policies. We talked about why so many experts failed to predict the Russian invasion of Ukraine, whether Putin has a grand strategy to turn Russia into a global power, and why his regime is much more fragile than it might seem. Enjoy. All right, so welcome to the podcast. Oh, my pleasure. So I think I'd like to start by making a little uh, reflection on the past uh, two years since uh, Russia invaded Ukraine. And I think on that note, if we go back all the way to the beginning, um, you were one of the relatively few people who correctly predicted that even though it would be a huge mistake, Putin might be making a different assumption than we did in the West and decide to invade anyway. And I think I'd like to start by asking you, why do you think that so many people who like you study Russia um, for a living got this major thing wrong and sort of refused this possibility until it happened? And if there is anything that you personally changed in how you think about Russia or how you try to analyze and predict what might happen based on uh, what happened on the 24th of February 2022. Yeah, I mean, what it really reflects is precisely the, the, the black box at the very center of Russian decision making. The, the fact that this is a hyper personalistic regime and Putin and the people he actually talks to, the few people he talks to on the whole, don't really share their, their innermost thoughts with us. I mean, look, I, I mean, I have to be honest that, yes, until about a week before, I thought that there was no more than a 40% chance that Putin was actually going to invade, because it did not make sense. Because actually, if he had been anything like this grand master of geopolitical chess that we're sometimes told, that in fact, what he was doing already, building up massive forces along the Ukrainian border, maintaining the pressure, was actually working. He was, in effect, winning. The Ukrainian economy was in crisis because investors were, were fleeing, frankly, because of the threat of Russian invasion. You had a steady stream of Western visitors flocking to Moscow, giving Putin precisely that position of centrality that he so likes. And I wouldn't say quite begging him not to invade, but pretty, pretty much. And also you had the beginnings of pressure being exerted by certain European countries in particular on Kyiv, to make some kind of concessions to Putin, precisely to avert war. You know, if he'd been smart, he just simply would have maintained the pressure and waited to see what kind of inducements he was given. The point is that we actually had an interesting duality. I mean, there were those of us who said, look, this, this will be disastrous for Russia if they do it. It doesn't make sense. And then there were those, and you know, we're talking particularly about the sort of the inside the beltway Washington voices, but also others, who were absolutely convinced that Putin did in, intend to invade. But almost invariably, these people also thought that it would all be over in a matter of a couple of weeks, that the Russians would roll right over Ukraine and, and have their way. So in, in some ways, it's just simply a question of you just got to pick which particular mistake you made. And I think, I mean, in the context of terms of what, what we've learned and such like, I mean, of course, I, I, I would say this, but I mean, I actually, I, I, I stick with my initial kind of assessments of Putin, that this is a man who is actually relatively risk averse, who essentially does not want to make moves unless he's pretty certain of the outcome. Where I got it wrong was in trying to, as it were, trying to understand how Putin saw the situation. I mean, it is clear that he seems genuinely to convince, to have convinced himself that Ukraine would just simply fall into his hand. Um, and after all, this is a man who genuinely doesn't believe that Ukraine is a country and that the Ukrainians are a people. 
And he seems to have believed what his own intelligence services were, were telling him about the fact that they had this huge network of Ukrainians who are willing to turn against Kyiv and welcome a, a new regime and such like. And no one, no one who clearly knew better within the Russian system, it seems, was willing to actually stand up and say, Vladimir Vladimirovich, this is not going to work the way you intend. And I'm, frankly, I think that even in that last week, Putin was still making up his mind whether to invade at all, whether to simply confine himself to the Donbass and southeastern Ukraine, or whether to, as he did, go for his full invasion. And in some ways, this is the lesson of the bizarre, surreal Security Council meeting, televised Security Council meeting that we saw that crucial week, in which you know, these really powerful figures within the Russian security state were clearly trying to guess what Putin had in mind and offer him that. I mean, again, this is the trouble with what are essentially monarchical regimes. Everyone wants to just simply pander to the monarch. And, and so, you know, even the, the super hawk himself, Nikolai Patrushev, Secretary of the Security Council, was actually coming out saying, let's continue to negotiate. Let's see what we can get. So, I mean, even at that point, you know, again, people clearly didn't know what Putin had in mind. So in some ways, I think there's a degree to which we should give ourselves a break. You know, if even the people closest to Putin didn't really know what he intended, perhaps it's not too surprising that we ultimately got caught out. I would like to uh, follow up on something that you've mentioned and that I've heard you mention before, um, that you don't think Putin is this grand strategist and uh, 40 chess player that sometimes he's presented as and that he's more of an opportunist um and i was wondering why what leads you to to this assessment i think it's because time and again what we tend to see is precisely um short-term moves which it's not like he has no no goal he clearly has a sense of what he would like. He wants a Russia which is regarded as powerful, that is considered to be another pole of the world, uh, analogous to the United States. He believes that Russia needs to have a sphere of influence, that uh, most of the countries of the post-Soviet Union, with, I would say, the exception of the Baltic states, have to be considered, you know, their sovereignty is subordinate to Moscow's interests. It's a very 19th century notion of geopolitics. So he has a sense of where he'd like to be. What he doesn't clearly have is a strategy, which is a sort of a, a roadmap for how you get there. Instead, what we see him is making all kinds of, um, well, as I said, going back to it, opportunist moves, which he thinks might might get him closer to that. And often they are contradictory. Often they are, as I say, very short termist. And even if we think of the, the invasion of Ukraine, I mean, what's clear is that there was no clear planning for this. The, the, you know, the military did not have the chance to, to build up the resources and above all the men that they needed. Um, you ended up with a, a peacetime Russian army going in against a fully mobilized Ukraine, which proved to be you know, one of their many disastrous blunders. And, and so I think this, this is what we see. It's actually it's very hard unless one really sort of works hard to, to kind of generate one to see any kind of a strategy. Instead, whether it's um, backing various kleptocratic states in Africa, whether it's in terms of making deals with Turkey that one minute sees the Turks shooting down a Russian plane and the next sees them essentially working in, in, in cooperation. I mean, you know, there's a lot of stuff happening and each of which is clearly intended to, to move Russia in the, in the right direction from Putin's perspective. But there is no strategy. If I go back to the 24th of February when the uh, invasion started and uh, you look back at what you were thinking back then about how it would go down and you look at it now, um, how different was the idea you had back then from what really happened and what were some of the things that you were expected to happen differently, whether in um, from the military perspective of how or what has happened in Russia internally? Sure. I mean, in terms of the, the military perspective, I mean, in a way, once, once the invasion had started, you know, it looked entirely feasible that Kyiv would fall. And to be honest, you know, now in hindsight, we see that if, if the Russians had had a little bit more preparation, or more to the point, had been willing to take more losses, 
I mean, I think this is what tended to happen. You, you, you had field commanders who hadn't really been prepared for this and who tended to actually become quite conservative and stop when they were you know, met with any kind of opposing force. If they had, in what is frankly the classic Russian way, bulled through, they probably would have taken Kiev. Now, that does not mean they would have taken Ukraine, though. And I think in many ways what we would have seen is actually Putin in the role of Napoleon. You know, Napoleon eventually sort of seizes Moscow and then is, is quite infuriated when the Tsar does not capitulate. And he sort of sits there in Moscow much longer than he should, waiting for what he expects to be the, the surrender and then is, is forced to withdraw. Well, whether or not uh, Putin would have been forced to, to, to withdraw, certainly that would not have meant that the, the Ukrainians would have capitulated. It just simply would have meant that the Russians would also have had to police and control a large city full of very disgruntled Ukrainians, many of whom would have turned to guerrilla and terrorist operations against them. Um, so, I mean, in some ways, although politically speaking, that would have been a significant victory for the Russians, in strategic terms, it would have been much, much less significant. In general terms, the fact that actually the Russians were not going to make much headway was, was fairly clear. I mean, as I say, the Ukrainians, not only did they have a lot of soldiers, and remember, usually the assumption is that if you're in the offence, you need to have quite a substantial you know, three to one or similar advantage. But also, the Ukrainians have been wargaming and planning for this for eight years. And you know, if anyone understands how the Russians fight, it's the Ukrainians. So we saw all kinds of tactical innovations, the use of you know, small teams using anti-tank missiles and such like, you know, actually being deployed precisely to, to slow and blunt the Russian attack. Now, in, in wider terms, I mean, it is astonishing how the Russians have managed to adapt in, in many ways, frankly, in a very clumsy, often rough and ready way, but they have adapted to many of the realities of this war on a tactical level. And yet, how phenomenally stupid they still are on a strategic operational level. You know, if we look at Avdivka, another one of these meat grinder war battles that are currently taking place, in which the Russians are taking very, very heavy losses for a city that, I mean, has a little bit more tactical value, frankly, than Bakhmut, the, the earlier sort of token city. But nonetheless, you know, it's still not worth the, the risks. And again, I think what this demonstrates is that in, in, in the same way as you have Russian technocrats at home trying desperately and often actually very successfully to adapt to the new needs of the war, the impact of sanctions and so forth. Well, so too you have a, a military which is doing its best to try and adapt in very suboptimal circumstances, but in both cases they're doing so despite Putin, despite the instructions that are coming down from on high. You know, clearly Putin wants an, an essentially offensive war, and Gerasimov, the chief of the general staff, is not going to gainsay him, and is providing that and essentially threw away the advantage of mobilization in the summer of 22-23, sorry, the, the, the winter of 22-23, and is now again throwing away what, what reserves they have in, in Avdivka. So again, what we're actually seeing is all the, um, the vulnerabilities and the flaws of Putinism being played out on the battlefield. The fact that you still, even after Prigozhin's death, have sort of multiple sources of command on, on the field, the National Guard, the Chechens, various mercenary organizations, as well as the regular military. The fact that clearly a man who has almost no meaningful military experience is still essentially calling the shots when it comes to overall strategy, i.e. Putin. Um, you know, and so I think that this, this has been what, what's really interesting is we had no idea quite how the flaws of Putinism would play out on the, on, you know, in the war, but we knew that they would. And they're playing out in many ways, in, 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 in some of the most kind of disastrous manners possible. And the last point I'd make in terms of sort of comparison is, look, I mean, we also have to recognize the degree to which the Ukrainians were not only very tough in the resistance against the Russians, which was predictable, but less predictable has been precisely how imaginative they've been. I mean, this is a war in which the Ukrainians have not just largely outfought the Russians, but they've also outthought them. You know, we, we have seen them being much, much more capable, whether it's in terms of practical things like converting simple drones that you can buy on Amazon into becoming weapons of war. I mean, they very much pioneered that. 
all the way through to some of their their sort of strategic approaches or operational approaches, such as, for example, you know, their their very successful offensive based out of uh, Kharkiv. So I think you know that that's also been something that, in a way, not necessarily a surprise in essence, but a surprise in just how effective the Ukrainians have been. And internally, if you look at Russia, how has the country changed? Whether the leadership and and the power structures how they work or um the general population or how does this state work has it moved anywhere since the beginning of the invasion i mean it has much like putin himself become almost more of a caricature of itself um you know we have seen it become more authoritarian more dependent upon propaganda more concerned with essentially neutralizing the population rather than really trying to inspire them. And these are all kind of classic instruments of authoritarian regimes. I think what we've seen, and this was a process that frankly predates the war, is the earlier form of Putinism, which was in some ways a fairly postmodern form of authoritarianism that didn't depend on fear, on arrests and on suppression, but a lot more about controlling the narrative about you know convincing people that actually this was their cause as well and convincing people who are disaffected that they were very much in a minority and isolated and really should should just keep quiet now we've moved into a you know a, a much more straightforward era of you know outright lies in the propaganda sphere rather than sort of clever cunning spun spun narratives about using violence oppression and threat rather than just, again, sort of just simply trying to kind of win people over. Um, but again, this was, I, I think this is a process that we saw before the invasion. It's been accelerated by it. And in some ways, it's also accelerated, not just by the fact that it's this, the regime is now in, in, in what is a, a, a tough existential struggle, I would say, not for not for Russia, but for the regime, but also by the fact that it has empowered some of the worst Uh, impulses of Putin and Putinism. I mean, we see this new narrative about the fact that this is not really about Ukraine. This is about a grand struggle against the West. The West is hegemonic. The West is trying to force Russia to bend the knee, to change our ways, to impose its decadent uh, cultural values upon us. And we're just fighting back. And look, this is a convenient narrative for Putin because essentially it means that everyone is now framed as being facing a choice. Are you a patriot or are you a traitor? In in old Putinism, there was a huge middle ground. In some ways, Putinism was, was saying, look, we don't really care what you think. Just as long as you don't move against the regime, look, we, that doesn't really matter. Now it's much more, no, 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 you, you need to actually demonstrate that you're not just not against the regime, but for it, or else we assume you are against it. So I think you know that 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 middle ground is now shrinking dramatically. I wonder why you think that you've mentioned that um, uh, Putin's regime is going through an uh, existential struggle, and if you, if you could maybe explain that, because you could also argue that from the outside the regime looks pretty uh, robust and and solid, uh, doesn't really have a population that would be. Um, that would look like it might revolt at any point. The after Prigozhin's revolt, it looks like the internal uh, command and disputes were sort of consolidated. So I guess you could make the argument that it now looks like it could go on um, without too much of an issue for. Um, fairly long time. This is the paradox. I mean, you're absolutely right in what you've been saying in terms of, look, this is still a regime which is really solidly in place. There is no question about that. There, there is no meaningful political opposition. I mean, there are some particular figures, but uh, essentially, you know, increasingly they are behind bars, whether we're talking about people like Alexei Navalny on the liberal wing or people indeed like Igor Girkin Strelkov on the sort of hyper-nationalist wing. At the same time, you know, it's not only that, that there's not much evidence of mass protest, but that the elite really have fallen into line after Prigozhin's mutiny, or more to the point, after Prigozhin's plane had its mysterious, unexplained mid-air dismantling. And I think 
the point is though that if we talk about the the the, the killing of Prigozhin, what was really striking and I think shocking for the elite about that was this is the first time that Putin has in effect broken a, a promise with someone who could be considered an insider. You know, it's not like that this is just some opposition figure. You know, Prigozhin was not a close confidant of Putin's, but he was definitely, you know, one of Putin's people. And a deal had been struck and and, and Putin broke it. And that was seriously shocking for, for the elite. And yes, it got a lot of people in line because they are, you know, feeling more like um, the hostages after the um, terrorist has just shot one of them. Everyone else suddenly gets gets very, very sort of polite at that point. Doesn't make them happy though. And I think you know what what we actually see is a system which you know is clearly able to control at the moment the how say day to day problems which may arise. It's very strong. But what I would suggest is that it's increasingly brittle. Its capacity to respond to systemic shocks is constantly declining. And with each new crisis, it declines a little bit more because there are essentially three fundamental pillars of the Putin system. Putin's own personal authority and his capacity to manage intra-elite disputes, his capacity to throw money at problems, essentially to buy off sectoral groups, and ultimately his capacity to use violence to his control over the coercive apparatus. Now, all three of those are bit by bit coming under pressure. I mean, we see in terms of sort of Putin's own personal standing, um, his approval ratings are still relatively high, but his trust ratings are low. I think that's often it's the trust ratings that for me, I think, are a much more telling indicator of what people really think about him. And certainly his capacity to control the elite um, and manage the intra-elite disputes, which are central to his style of divide and rule control. I think that has been shown up by the, precisely the Prigozhin mutiny. I mean, that was a failure of Putin's. People have been telling him that Prigozhin's rivalry with Defence Minister Shoigu was becoming increasingly problematic. Putin did nothing. Uh, this clear awareness of that. I think this is a sense that in some ways Putin is no longer the Putin of, of yore. Money, clearly money is increasingly under pressure. I mean, there's, there's still a lot of it around, but so much of it is now committed to the war that there's just that much less, shall we say, sort of free, spare, emergency cash to deal with crises. And we're already beginning to see that in terms of the damage to the civilian economy. And in terms of control of the security apparatus, again, I wouldn't want to play it over much. But if one looks at what happened during Prigozhin's mutiny, for me, one of the most striking things was the degree to which the military, the, the National Guard, the rest of the security apparatus did not, as Prigozhin had expected, join his mutiny. I mean, he himself said, oh, half the army will join me. And that didn't happen. But on the other hand, nor did they show any great enthusiasm for actually stopping him. You know, we saw the garrison in Rostov-on-Don essentially decide to just stay behind their, you know, stay behind their garrison walls while Wagner was, was in the city. On that fateful Saturday, we saw the head of the National Guard, Zolotov, essentially on the phones trying to get in touch with his various regional commanders along the route of march to get them to try and block the mercenaries. And a lot of his local commanders essentially made damn sure that he couldn't reach them so that they didn't get a, a direct order that they'd either have to obey or directly disobey. It was a lot easier just to kind of basically wait it out and see what happened. So, I mean, I think we've already seen that, in fact, the, the enthusiasm for Putin's regime within the security apparatus is much less than we might have assumed. Sure, he's still got the guys at the very top working for him but if the actual operational the field commanders won't take their calls then they're just a bunch of old men in uniform so i think you know in, in that respect all of these mean that actually this this is a system which sure can can well survive for years but so much of that depends on what particular systemic shocks it receives and this is why the war is existential i mean it's fine if you have a, i mean maybe if you have a stalemate that isn't too bloody perhaps that's bearable but what happens if there's a collapse of the front lines what happens if i mean the most extreme example crimea is essentially retaken by by kiev i mean i think these would be shocking signs of failure on putin's part and i think this is one of the reasons why he's so worried about the potential outcome is he himself isn't convinced that he could survive a defeat in Ukraine.
I wonder, talking about the war, I wonder what you think about the idea that by now um, the Putin's regime has invested so much into the war and has hyped up the militaristic sentiments in Russia so much that it actually needs the war to continue and um, that it cannot afford for it to end or for for it to end in some kind of a uh, ending that wouldn't be a complete victory. I mean, there's an element of truth in that, but I think there's a point, few points to make in 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 return. First of all, there's very little evidence that, in fact, Putin's regime's militaristic rhetoric is having a huge amount of traction with the Russian people. I mean, if you look at, for example, some of the more effective polling by organisations like Russian Field. I mean, what they're actually showing is a growing proportion of the Russian population actually favours negotiations. Now, again, we shouldn't read too much into that. Negotiations does not necessarily mean surrender or anything like that. It could just simply be, let's give the, the Ukrainians a chance to surrender. And in some ways, that's really what Putin means when he and Defence Minister Shoigu and others say, of course, we're willing to talk to the Ukrainians. But nonetheless, I think it's interesting that the direction of movement is a growing proportion of Russians who are happy to hear talk about the potentiality for negotiation. So it's it's not like I think ordinary Russians are saying, no, absolutely, the Ukrainians are beasts and we cannot stop until we, we have destroyed them or similar. Likewise, it's worth noting that although there are figures within the elite who are clearly benefiting from the war, the majority are not. The majority, whether it's in terms of they're just sort of holding the ground, but in fact, you know, actually it, it, it's an increasingly problematic environment for many within the elite. Um, who actually would, on the whole, prefer to return to, in my, in my opinion, the old days when they could steal at home and continue to bank and spend and enjoy life abroad. So, I mean, in that context, we shouldn't underestimate the capacity of the regime to spin a lot of things short of a, a real victory. I mean, look, I think it's increasingly unlikely at the moment that they will lose Crimea. If they can find some kind of a, of a deal which you know, gives them claim to Crimea, maybe either continued control over the Zaporizhia land bridge or Kaliningrad style sort of access rights so that you know, they, they can still send trains and so forth to Crimea from the mainland through Ukraine um, you know, and, and a few other things. There's ways in which they, they can spin this because they have now framed this as not about Ukraine but about a wider Russian struggle with the West. And therefore to say, look, the whole weight of NATO descended upon us and still we fought them back. Secondly, that they're now framing this much more in terms of people than land. We fought this so that the Russian speakers of southeastern Ukraine would not be oppressed by the Nazis of Kiev. A ridiculous argument, but nonetheless, you know, it, it, one that is prevalent. You know, if they can say, well, frankly, anyone who wants to can now come to Russia. Remember, Russia actually could do with more workers. Um, it was not about the land. It was never about this particular field, this particular town. It was about the people. And we've saved the people. And if Russia wants to rebuild these, these rubbled and ruined cities, sorry, if Ukraine wants to build them, then that, that's their business. I mean, look, there's all kinds of different ways. But I mean, I think we, we shouldn't underestimate the state's capacity to spin, particularly when actually it is spinning something that a lot of people would like to hear. So I think that the, the, the issue is not, you know, can Russia abandon or can Putin abandon the war? I think he can in what he would think of the right terms. It's that, look, he will only do so if he either feels he has to or he's got what he regards as a good deal. Neither of those do I see as at the moment anywhere near being the, the case. You know, Russia can continue this war for probably years. And likewise, at the moment, there's no real chance that the Ukrainians can or will offer Putin anything that he really could spin as a victory. But somewhere down the line, I don't think we can absolutely rule it out. I'd like to follow up on one point that you mentioned about uh, that the elite would like for, or at least some of them would like the war to end and sort of the situation to go back where it was uh, before. Um, where they could enjoy their lives in the West and the money they've had, um, uh, 
much more they, than they can, can do now. And to play uh, devil's advocate uh, for a little bit, it sounds a little bit like an argument that we've heard quite a lot in the beginning of the war um, when we've introduced the sanctions for the first time. And there was a lot of people who've predicted that once we introduce these strict sanctions that will really mostly impact the elites, the elites will then immediately uh, turn against Putin and, and, and the regime and that will, it will have a really strong impact once they won't be able to access their villas and, and yachts and, and bank accounts in, in, in London and uh, Switzerland. And that didn't happen. And I was wondering why, uh, how do you reflect on that and how, I guess, that shapes your thinking about the, this um, elite thinking for the future? Yeah, look, I mean, the, the sanctions, certainly the personal sanctions regime was always going to be a non-starter frankly it was it was based on a deep misunderstanding of how things work in russia look yes many in the, in the elite are very unhappy at no longer being able to have access to their their yachts and their villas and such like but what can they do about it in practical terms these are people who have no power we've seen over recent years and again this is what i mean about the sort of the increasing authoritarianism not being something that started in february 2022 over the years, they have increasingly found themselves politically marginalized compared with, you know, more subterranean figures, shall we say, within the security elite, people who don't have villas abroad and, and the like. And therefore, what happened is, look, they, they found themselves in a position in which, you know, let's say you're a, a rich Russian, not quite an oligarch, a minigarch. And you know, let's say you're very unhappy with what's going on. What are you going to do about it? I mean, you, you are not in a position to what, bankroll an opposition figure. Well, that's not going to happen because there's no meaningful opposition and they're not going to be allowed to, to, to do so. And the moment you do that, you also throw yourself open to being arrested, deprived of your assets or, or whatever else. You know, we have a situation in which the elite is functionally atomized. And I think there's a lot of people who probably would very much like something to be done about Putin as long as someone else does it. You know, how do you start that conversation? How do you actually open up a conversation about we need to do something about Putin? When you have no idea if your phone is being monitored, if your, your building is being bugged, if the person you're talking to will actually turn you into the authorities tomorrow um, because they don't trust you, they think you're an agent provocateur, or because they think that in, in fact, that, you know, it, it, it's too dangerous to have this kind of com conversation. I mean, this is this is the problem. I mean, actually, authoritarian, increasingly totalitarian regimes tend to be pretty damn good at deterring any kind of direct movement against them. Who actually could topple Putin? It will only come at this stage from the men with guns. The security apparatus, the military, and so forth, and there's you know the and these are all carefully monitored and controlled and balanced against each other, um, precisely for this reason that actually, coup proofing is one of the few things that the Russians have a long history of really doing pretty damn well. So I think in the circumstances, again, th the difference is not so much you know whether it's actually the sort of the uh, the elite and the technocrats and so forth are happy or not. It's are they actually in a position to do anything about it? And the answer is no. But this is what I mean about the fact that if, let's say, Putin eventually does reach some kind of a deal, because let's say he feels it's it's necessary for his own political survival or whatever, you know, the technocrats and the and the elites will be happy to go along with it, because it will actually suit their needs. But we're nowhere near a position where they can impose that upon Putin. And the other problem with the um, personal sanctions regime is there's no real route out of it. I mean, again, if let's say you, you are one of these oligarchs and you've just had loads of your property seized in the West. There is no straightforward sense of if you do X and Y, we'll unfreeze it. You know, if you flee to the West and denounce Putin and all his works, everything will be fine. It's well, if you do that, then we'll consider you can hire some expensive lawyers. You can make a case. I mean, we have someone like Arkady Valosh who's the, basically the guy behind Yandex, Russia's Google, which is a phenomenally effective and successful company. Now, he's, he's out of Russia. He is about the only one of the sort of, you know, the oligarchs of the Putin era who has openly and you know, transparently denounced 
the invasion and the Putin regime. You know, it hasn't it hasn't been weasel words like conflicts are bad. He has actually said the, 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 that this is a sort of terrible crime. He's basically written off all of his assets that are still back in Russia. And yet he's still under EU sanctions. Um, you know, he, he applied to have EU sanctions lifted and, and it didn't happen. So this is it. You know, it, it's more or less what we're actually saying to people is, sure, you want to you want to try and come out and make yourself you know, at risk and, and run the, the potential that Putin's assassins will come after you. You know, if Putin regards you as a traitor. That's not impossible. And maybe you'll get lucky and maybe you won't. You know, we have done nothing to make it to make it easy or possible for people to un think of a route out of that. So what happens is if you're still stuck in Russia and you've lost all your assets out the country, you just simply become all the more dependent on the state, not just not to arrest you, but also for government contracts to keep your businesses running and, and everything else. So we ironically, with our personal sanctions regime, have actually strengthened Putin's position and also forced people to um, either keep their heads down or turn themselves into sort of hyper patriots in the hope that this will keep themselves safe. One of the, I think, lessons that we've mentioned again and again um, in the West is that we've sort of been overestimating the, the Russian military versus how their performance um, turned out in the actual conflict. Um, and I was wondering if the, the, the Russian assessment of their own performance is similar to that. And if there is any kind of uh, reflection in that, in the higher ranks of the military or the, um, the Kremlin or the secret services, and how do they actually see what has happened uh, since uh, the beginning of the invasion? And quite honestly, the number of blunders that they've uh, managed to do since then. Yeah, I mean, it's it's often obviously very difficult for people within the system in particular to actually talk candidly about what's happened in, in any kind of negative way. We are seeing the emergence of or the beginnings of a debate, but it's actually very Soviet in that if you can talk about bad stuff, you can't talk about it openly. And often what happens is you end up using history as your kind of metaphor. So it's interesting that, for example, we're seeing a resurgence in discussions about the beginnings of the Soviet war in Afghanistan. Not really because they want to talk about the Soviet war in Afghanistan, but, um, you know, a rather foolish invasion that was expected to be a very short term police action that was launched by a bunch of old men who didn't really have a good sense of quite what was going on in the country. I mean, you know, the the parallels in that respect are fairly obvious, but that's the whole point. You can't actually talk directly about it. So it, it's actually very difficult to say at the moment. I mean, there clearly is some kind of an awareness. On the one hand, there are lessons being learned which are considered to be very ap applicable to the future in terms of particularly the use of drones and electronic warfare, which will in due course actually make the Russian military someday more formidable. But on the other hand, also catastrophic blunders. I think at the moment there is still the face-saving discussion that says that it's because the political leadership didn't give us the proper kind of warning and the scope to fight the war the way we would, which is perfectly true. I mean, actually, the invasion did not follow how Russian military doctrine would say you would fight a war at this scale. And also blame on particular figures such as Chief of the General Staff Gerasimov. So, you know, there are ways of trying to say it's not actually our fault. But in, in practice, it is clear that there, there are some deep fundamental problems. And I think it's also, you know, one of the issues is that the Russians are, are grappling with a similar sort of conceptual problem as we have. Russians had been going through military reform before February 22, which was still incomplete, but has not was not entirely unsuccessful. But a central element of that military reform was precisely transitioning away from a Soviet-style military, which is really built for a big war, into a, a future in which actually Russia would have the kind of flexible power projection forces 
that could be used for rapid deployments into not just neighboring countries, but further countries, which is precisely what happened to Western militaries. You know, they, 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 they got used to Afghanistan's rather than, than, than big wars. And so ironically, actually, military reform left the Russians less capable of fighting a big war in Ukraine than they might otherwise have been, let's say, sort of 10 years ago. So it's an interesting kind of paradox there. Um, but there is still this debate about, well, OK, in the future, as and when force reconstruction happens post-war, do we need to go back to a Soviet model so that we can actually field you know, a, a real one, one million man army, two million once we've brought up our reservists, which is incredibly expensive and distorting to your overall military structure to actually have to continue to maintain? Or do we think, well, I don't know, you, Ukraine, that was just an anomaly. And we'll go back to being able to sort of deploy you know, a few thousand special forces and paratroopers and things into Kazakhstan to help uh, you know, tilt the balance of power in a coup, as they did in January of 2022, or you know, to send into somewhere like Syria. Um, and in a way, you can't really do both unless you're willing to spend a hell of a lot of money. And Russia's economy is going to be in a position where it's probably unlikely to be able to spend a hell of a lot of money in the future. So, I mean, I think they, they are grappling with this, but that's very much at the moment on the back burner. And as I said, being discussed in kind of allegorical terms at the moment, it's just a question of dealing with crises because you know, essentially the Russian military is in a crisis mode. It lost so many of its best troops and its best commanders in the early month or two of the war thrown away. I mean, if you look at the special forces, the Spetsnaz, for example, I mean, they were decimated by essentially being used just simply as assault infantry, not really their role. Um, that although they now have forces that are called Spetsnaz, if you look at the lot of composition, I mean, a lot of them are you know, conscripts or they're people who really haven't had anything like the kind of training that we would think of as special forces quality. Um, so I think at the moment, it's just a question of just dealing with what's tomorrow's crisis rather than thinking about big picture w with a Russia's military. And when it comes to the intelligence services, because I would imagine if I would be Putin or Trushev or someone from the top political leadership, and I would be hearing before the invasion that uh, Ukraine is weak, it's going to fall apart, and Ukrainians are going to be welcoming the Russian soldiers uh, with open arms. And then I would see the exact opposite of what the FSB has been telling me play out. I would be probably quite angry at my own spies, especially if, as Putin, I would have um, a lot of affinity for them beforehand. Yeah, this is one of the fascinating things about it, that actually it doesn't seem to have happened. I mean, absolutely. Look, I mean, again, I don't think we can put the full blame for the invasion on particularly the FSB, the Federal Security Service, that was the sort of key element that uh, was involved in setting up what were meant to be networks of sympathizers and so forth across Ukraine. However, there doesn't seem to have been any fallout from the fact that they clearly were just telling Putin what he wanted to hear and lent into his unrealistic assumptions about Ukraine and, and Ukrainians. I mean, there was talk at one point that uh, General Beseda, the head of the relevant element in department within the FSB, had been put under house arrest, but that seems not to have been the case. Um, in, in practice, there has been no real inquisition. And is it that Putin is, is too stupid to realize what, what, what happened? I don't know. I mean, it's not entirely impossible. He clearly has a very soft spot, particularly for the FSB, the service that, after all, is not only probably closest to the old KGB in which he served, but also that he was director for a year. But I think it also reflects the fact that actually Putin appreciates that he depends on these agencies and that he's at the best of times, he doesn't like reshuffling his top team. I mean, if you look at you know, I actually feel a certain sympathy in, in this respect for him. Foreign Minister Lavrov, you know, since 2014, every year he has been petitioning Putin to be allowed to retire. Every year Putin says no. You know, he doesn't want to run the risk of actually having to come up with a, you know, a new foreign minister and so forth. 
Um, you know, he, he held on to the head of the Federal Protection Service, Murov, for years you know, after his retirement, even, if, even though Murov kept asking to be allowed to leave. So I think you know, in, in this case, I think there's also an element in which Putin is unwilling to essentially unleash his ire on the apparatus that he feels is most necessary for his own survival because it will be necessarily disruptive. But that is, again, one of one of his many blind spots and blunders from this, that you would think that he would realize that the culture which he has created, it has to be said, in which the intelligence services don't tell him what he needs to know, but tell him what they think he wants to hear, is actually deeply problematic. But, you know, so far, at least, it doesn't seem to be that he has a problem with with what the intelligence services has been doing for him. There's this one thing that I, I have to ask you, and I would be very curious to hear what you think. Um, I don't know if you've seen it, but there has been a, a policy paper from uh, the DGAP, the German government um, think tank. Uh, it's called Preventing the Next War. And basically, the main thesis of the paper is that uh, we should urgently prepare for a potential conflict with Russia, meaning Europe and NATO, because if Russia um, sees within the next um, decade that it has a potential, poten potentially successful uh, option of taking the Baltics uh, through a military invasion, it would do so. And especially in Central Europe, in, in Czech Republic, Poland, the paper has really received an, an unusual amount of attention and the Polish National Security Advisor responded to it saying that he doesn't think that it's uh, six to ten years, but it's rather more like three years. Um, uh, and the Telegraph has been covering it yesterday in their podcast. And I would be really curious to hear what you think about the the basic assessment of the situation and whether that is really something that we should be taking seriously and that we should be taking as an as an imminent worry and something that should shape our thinking and and strategy when it comes to Russia. I mean I must admit I I found that quite an unusual paper. Um first of all there's absolutely no evidence that Putin has territorial ambitions in Europe. Even the Baltic states, yes, they were part of the, the old Soviet Union after World War II, but nonetheless, you know, with a lot of ill grace, Putin seems to have appreciated that they, they've gone their own way. Putin is not trying to rebuild the Soviet Union. Otherwise, you know, why haven't we seen invasions of Kyrgyzstan or, or whatever? No, I mean, it's, we have to realize that it's, it's a lot more complex and nuanced than that. Secondly, look, there is every sign that actually Putin is well aware that Russia is not the equal of NATO militarily. Um, you know, Article 5, the, the, the issue of Article 5 guarantees of, of, of mutual security is one that the Russians, in some ways, I think the Russians actually are more competent about, because they think of NATO as essentially as America's Warsaw Pact. So although sometimes, you know, we may have these concerns, would Spain fight for Estonia or whatever? You know, I think the Russians don't simply because they mirror image and they just assume that Spain wouldn't get a choice because Washington would, would tell them to. So actually, I, th I think they, they, they do regard NATO as being very sort of powerful as a defensive alliance, rightly. It's worth noting that after all, you know, European NATO has more troops than the Russians, even without including the Canadians and the Americans. Um, and most of those are rather better troops. but. Beyond that, you know, why else be so worried about countries joining NATO if you don't think that once they are joined into NATO, that actually they, they, they become that much harder to threaten, influence and, and the like. Then we have the issue of the speed of force reconstitution. Now, there's, there's a lot of debate about how long it would take the Russians to be able to reconstitute their forces after the end of a war. And again, um, a war that unfortunately it's worth noting shows no sign of ending. And I think 2025 would seem to be the most optimistic end date. Some people see, seem to think that it's going to happen incredibly quickly. However, if one looks at production capability, unless the Russians are planning on just trying to buy their whole army off the peg, or at least the kit for it, from the Chinese, um, you know, there just is no way the Russians could reconstitute their forces that quickly. I mean, at the moment, the Russians, for example, are producing a, a 
getting a lot of tanks ready to, for the front line. But, you know, of the thousand or so that that's happened, only 200 of those were new builds. The other 800 were rescued from, you know, old you know, their old kit from arsenals, much of which is, frankly, unusable. And so they, they're at the moment, they're kind of picking the ones that work. But, you know, but we're seeing T-62s and T-55s now, now being ready for battle. You know, this is not the kind of kit that you can put up against an army, armies of Abrams and Challenger 2s and Leopard 2s. Um, with with any kind of of real sort of chance of success, and also just they're, they're going to run out of those stocks. Um, you know they're not quite there yet, but I think I suspect that by the end of twenty twenty four they will essentially have plundered all the usable chassis um, of of old tanks. So you know without going too much into the kind of the wonkery, I mean I I think that actually even if the Russians are willing and able to spend what it'll cost, which is going to be a hell of a lot, and you know the Russian economy. If you look at the current budget the t for 2024, they're envisaging spending a third of their federal budget on, on, on the military, which is a, a massive amount and more since actually the end of the Soviet Union. However, if you look at the budget assumptions, the Ministry of Finance is working on the assumption that that actual spend will be d diminished dramatically in 2025. In other words, even the Ministry of Finance is acknowledging we cannot spend at this level long term. And that's the kind of spend you'd need to reconstitute that rapidly. So, I mean, I, I think it's very doubtful that the Russians either would reconstitute so quickly, and even if they did, that they would actually feel that they can tangle with, with NATO, which, after all, is now spending more, some would say not enough, but at least more on its defence. However, all that said, look, I, I can't, I mean, look, if one looks particularly at Germany's position, um, you know, although with the Zeitenwender, it, it's it's committing more to its defence and so forth, but there are real questions as to either either a whether what they're actually committing is enough, and b whether it really will manifest in reality. And I suspect, I don't know, but I suspect that the report from De Gaupe is in part over making, you know, overplaying the point precisely to try and scare the German political elite into taking defence seriously, finally. Um, look, there's always this question of, with defence planning, you think of the worst case scenario, but you can't always plan for every single worst case. So you also have to think about what is the worst plausible case. I think that the, um, the report pushes things beyond the worst plausible into the worst conceivable case for clear political reasons. I'm in this respect, maybe dangerously, but nonetheless, otherwise unfashionably optimistic. So final question to, to end the conversation with uh, is something that I have never really heard you talk about, but I would be interesting to learn more. And that's sort of the, the policy that we as a West have towards Russia. You've mentioned that you don't think the Russian, uh, that Putin is a strategist with a, a grand vision, but rather an opportunist reacting to uh, what's happening and taking whatever um, opportunity he has to advance his interests. And I would be interested to hear what do you think are, as like the collective West policy to sort of contain the current Russian regime should be. And how is it different it to the policy that we have now? In other words, what what would you have changed, and how would you approach Russia if you were the uh, the um, for example the uh, Russia advisor to the U.S. president? Yeah, that's an interesting one, and it also speaks to the fact that. It's really difficult for there be to be a Western policy or a Western strategy, because we are, after all, a constellation of democracies and democracies, many of which, frankly, are facing elections shortly, which further complicates matters, whether we're talking about. You know, I mean, next year, we, we, we're going to see elections in the United States. We're going to see elections in the United Kingdom and well, actually and, and indeed in Russia. But those are rather less uh, unpredictable. Um, I think that you know what we what we find ourselves in a position is that essentially we are still scrambling to have a proper strategy because we don't yet really know what we want. Yeah, in general terms, we want Russia to leave Ukraine. We want Russia to stop being a threat, to stop being a uh, general irritant on on the global scene. 
well that that's fine and that's nice but you know we haven't yet really married that to what are our kind of practical likelihoods and in particular you know when it comes to the war we haven't really come to terms with the fact that what ukraine needs is not just a theory of victory how to beat the russians but a theory of security how to be secure long term so i mean i think we need to be a, a lot clearer about where we think this is likely to end and in part that's actually going to mean some tough conversations with the ukrainians i mean i really don't don't think that uh, we can be certain that crimea will end up returning to ukrainian control i mean i, I you know i'm not saying that that's right I'm just saying that that is likely to happen. And if we build a policy around every single square centimeter of Ukrainian soil must be returned to the Russians, uh, mm -hmm. returned to the Ukrainians, then actually we are setting ourselves up for a very, very long potential conflict. So I think the first thing is, you know, we, we need to be having serious conversations between ourselves and with the Ukrainians about you know, plausible, likely outcomes. Because at the moment, Zelensky's 10 point plan, which includes things like war crimes tribunals, look, we are not going to see Putin in a, a cell or a court in The Hague, unless there's some kind of very dramatic regime change in, in, in Moscow. Um, so, you know, in some ways, having that on the, the list of, of requirements is, is just causing problems. We also have to think long term about our relationship with Russia, because in the long term, Ukraine's security depends not on being a member of NATO or the European Union, though I think both of those are entirely right and proper. But actually, Ukraine's real security depends on a happy, prosperous, democratic Russia that acknowledges that Ukraine is a sovereign nation in all respects. That's not yet, unfortunately, anywhere near the horizon, let alone over it. But nonetheless, I mean, that is the truth of the matter. So long as Russia is an antagonist, Ukraine will have problems. So we also have to think in terms of, of actually, you know, what will bring Russia closer towards that? We haven't yet really thought about the fact of that there will be a Russia in, in Europe, one way or the other, and that there will be a post-Putin Russia. And I think my concern is that we're often, you know, we, we, we've frankly been a bit lackluster in much of our support for Ukraine but too performatively hostile towards Russia, which actually only helps Putin and his propagandists. You know, when, when you see things like the Finnish border being closed, then actually that just simply gives Putin's propagandists more grist to their mill. It makes them more able to be able to say, see, the West hates Russians, and that's all it is. So what I would like to see is a, a more concentrated and strategic approach to supporting Ukraine, which we've seen, for example, slowly coming to terms with the production of ammunition. But the actual supply of what kind of weapons is just simply the result of constant short-termism and, and political pressure. You know, F-16s, ridiculous, no, can't happen. Well, maybe they will. Okay, let's start training people. You know, there's no real sense that there's a, you know, a sequencing of someone thinking, well, actually, you know, F-16s are not a priority now, but they will be by this point. So we need to start working on towards that. It's all been just sort of so much pushed by you know, domestic political agendas, the need to keep up with others. You know, tanks, modern main battle tanks were totally inappropriate until the Brits said, well, we're, we're going to send them a few Challenger 2s. And then suddenly Leopard 2s came onto the table and so forth. So a coherent strategy to support Ukraine militarily as well as financially, but at the same time, a coherent political strategy that aims to essentially undermine the Putin regime. I'm not talking about regime change. We have a tendency to, we're much better at changing regimes than managing what happens afterwards. And I think that could potentially be disastrous. But nonetheless, you know, a strategy to try and do what we can to undermine the Kremlin and above all, prepare for a post-Putin relationship with, with Russians. That means a lot more kind of outreach. It's, it's the sort of subversion that we did so well in the Cold War. Um, you know, why else, after all, is there that huge um, TV tower in the middle of Prague? It was not actually in order to make sure that the signal went out. It was to precisely to try and block, jam, and over, over sort of master the signals that were coming from the West. You know, we, we had all these dark arts. Let's redeploy them.